Okay, everybody. Uh, good, good afternoon and welcome to the, the third sustainable energy use in horticulture webinar. So uh, my name is Donald Guerin and I am the Chagas Mushroom Advisor. Uh, today's webinar will focus on heating with biomass. Uh, so there's an ongoing shift away from fossil fuels and it's creating demand for heat using carbon neutral fuel sources. Uh, growers could potentially make a fuel savings by investing in wood chip uh, biomass boilers and growers uh, with a heat, high heat demand also could avail of this support scheme for renewable heat. So today at this webinar, I'm joined uh, with Donald Flanagan, who's the Chagas Nursery Stock Advisor, Barry Caslin, who's the Chagas Energy Specialist, Peter McMahon from Kilmoon Nurseries, uh, Kilmoon Cross Nurseries, and Jer Cross from Woodco. So uh, the schedule for today is Barry will present an overview of biomass boiler technology and will review the impacts of a range of fuel types. So while biomass technology is not new, it's becoming more relevant uh, with rising gas and oil prices. Barry will outline the financial benefits of switching to biomass in his presentation. Uh, Donald will open up, Donald Flanagan will shortly open up a poll uh, to, and he will look after the Q&A at the end of the session. So our guest speakers will also have uh, Peter and Jer will give their own experience of biomass. So before I hand you over to Barry, uh, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, so microphones and your screens are turned off for everyone except for the participants uh, who's, who's speaking today. So at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box. Uh, there you can find the questions as they rise throughout the webinar. Uh, there you can type in your questions as they rise throughout the webinar. Uh, Donald Flanagan then will put these questions to the speakers after at, at, at the end of the, the session. If you're having any technical difficulties throughout the presentation, don't worry. Uh, the event is being recorded and we'll put it, put it up in the Chagas Horticulture uh, Development Department YouTube channel. Uh, so we'll wrap up this the, the webinar at five o'clock sharp. So uh, at this stage, I'm going to hand you over to Donald Flanagan to take us through the poll. That's great, Donald. Thanks very much. Uh, so we have a poll here. I'm just going to open it if I can. Uh, so bear with me for a second. So I'm just launching that. I'm going to read through it with you. There's uh, five questions and it'll just give us an idea of who's joining us and what your experiences are and what kind of information you might be looking for. So the, the first question there is, uh, what's your main source of energy? So you've got options of gas, oil, biomass wood chip, biomass pellets or others. Uh, I'll give you a sec there. Um, Second question then is about what your annual uh, average usage is of heat. So what's your annual heat usage in megawatt hours? Um, and you can just pick one of these. So there's kind of um, uh, five um, ben, uh, marks there. So a zero to 500 megawatts, five to a thousand, a thousand to 2000, two to 3000, 3000 or more. And lastly, then you've got, I don't know. Um, question number three, are you considering installing a biomass boiler within the next 12 months? Um, we've got yes, no, and not sure. And then question number four, are you registered for the SS or H scheme? And uh, yes and no again. And lastly, we've got, are you using or planning to use supplementary CO2? Um, and that's our, our yes or no answer uh, for that. So that's question number five. So I'll just give you another a uh, couple of seconds to fill in those last few questions and say um, I'll run through the answers then or, or the results in just a moment. So Don, we've got a good few people online there. There's about 35 participants and um, so we've had a good engagement throughout the series so far. So it's been um, energy is obviously a very topical. Um, so what I'll do, I'll close the scheme there or sorry, close the, the survey. And I'll share the results there and we'll go through them. Okay. And then I'll hand back to Donald. So question number one, um, what's your main source of heating? So gas is coming out the top there with seven out of 11 or 64% people followed by other and then oil and biomass pellets uh, following up there. So no one there on the wood chips. Number two, what is your average annual heat usage in megawatt hours? Um, we're kind of evenly spread out there. So pretty much uh, the highest number there, though, is people who don't know. Okay, so again, we just encourage people to get, get the, the energy audit to try and find out what those benchmark figures are. 
Number three, are you considering installing a biomass boiler in the next 12 months? Um, yes, 45%, no, 27%, and not sure, 27%. So maybe that'll change after this webinar. Um, are you registered for the SSRH scheme? That's 11 out of 11. So that's 100% of our voters there are involved in it already. And are you using or planning to use supplementary CO2? Okay, so that's important for some of the sectors. So yes, is 27%. And no, seventy three percent. Okay, so quite interesting figures there, Donal. Yeah, and um, just to clarify uh, the, around the question, are you registered for the SSRH? So it was actually one hundred percent no. Uh, that wasn't. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good one, Donal. Oh, thanks. Thanks for spotting yeah. that. Yeah. Grand. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. just interesting. We've got a lot of uh, pr some producers here using gas and oil, which would be uh, suitable possibly for the SSRH scheme. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Barry. Uh, so Barry, if you want to share your presentation. Yep. You can hear me okay, Donald, can you? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's obviously a great opportunity for people who are on gas because that's one of the conditions of the SSRH is that you're moving away from a fossil fuel to a biomass fuel um, to a renewable fuel. So that, that would be a condition that you are on a fossil fuel at the moment. Uh, so that's a great opportunity for everyone to uh, make, make that change. So that's what I'm going to talk about is the SSRH, about biomass heating in general. <clears throat> and we can take questions then at the end. So um, I suppose just in relation to um, the mushroom industry and the horticultural industry in general, uh, if you take the mushroom industry, a very high reliance on heat. You can see there anywhere between 1,690 kilowatt hours of heat per ton, uh, down to maybe in best, best practice scenarios, 1,300 kilowatt hours per ton. So a fair bit of electricity be used in that sector there as well, but the vast majority is being used in heating and sterilization. Then if you move on to the um, uh, the glasshouse uh, sector, you can see there again, heating would be the biggest proportion of energy use there in terms of kilowatt hours per square meter. It's a different metric that we're using there and down to maybe best practice examples of where you have maybe 160 kilowatt hours per square meter. Uh, the electricity usage there, there would be a certain amount, but nothing compared to what the heat heating required, requirement would be. Uh, just in terms of biomass and the relative values of the different types of fuels, I think it's important to be um, aware of, um, of, of, of what the, they are, because I suppose it's different types of terminology, but the moisture content is very, very important in terms of determining the energy density in terms of gigajoules of energy per tonne, and that's how you're measuring it. So you, you can also talk in kilowatt hours of energy per ton. But if we look at the gigajoules of energy, because the joule is the standard unit of energy, uh, you know, it's 15 uh, would be the figure for log uh, wood, which would be air dried down to 20% moisture content. If that was wet, you'd be, you know, down to maybe seven gigajoules of energy per ton. If that was wet material at 50% moisture content, you'd be down as well as seven there. In the case of wood chip, uh, again, wood chip will be fairly dry material. Um, it, it should be in certain, uh, you know, below 20% moisture content in most situations, and that'll be on 15 uh, gigajoules of energy per ton. Wood pellets are would be a drier again. It'd be about 8% moisture, maybe down to 6% moisture content, and you'd have about 18 gigajoules of energy per ton of wood pellets. And you see grain, even if you're looking at things like hay or you know dry grass it's all around hovering between 15 to 18 gigajoules of energy per ton on a, 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 on a dry matter basis. And you can see their heating oil is much higher. Uh, just to convert that to kilowatt hours of energy per liter. So if you take heating oil or kerosene, it would be about 10.6 kilowatt hours of energy in a liter, LPG 7.8 kilowatt hours per liter. Um, wood, um, dry wood would be 5,200 kilowatt hours of energy per ton. But you never have it coming into you fully dry. So, you know, wood is generally can maybe 30, 35% moisture content, maybe 20% moisture content. And there will be a warranty on your boiler as regards what the what it can tolerate in terms of moisture content. So it's important to be aware of that at the time of the purchase of your boiler, that you know that what it, what, what it can tolerate in terms of um in in, in terms of moisture content. Um and it's so it's always in you know kilowatt hour uh, kilowatt hours of energy per ton based on the moisture content. So you can see their straw at twenty five percent moisture content will be around three thousand six hundred kilowatt hours of energy in a ton. So 
all has a value. So the to move on to the this terminology or the support scheme for renewable heat, and this is a new scheme that was introduced in June of 2019 to encourage the movement from fossil fuels such as coal, oil, or gas to renewable fuels such as wood chip, wood pellets, straw, the, all, the, that type of biomass heat pumps. Um, but this but this SSRH is really around biomass, so it's a biomass supporting tariff. Um, uh, and it is based on a tiered payment system. So the more you burn, the less you get paid. So tier one is between naught and 300 megawatt hours. And the, the, the column there is in cent per kilowatt hour, but it just moved the decimal place across that converts it to uh, euros per megawatt hour. So naught to 300 is 56 euro 60 cent per megawatt hour. The next tier is between 300 and 1000 megawatt hours. So if you're in, tier one and tier two uh, maxed out in that it should be 300 megawatt hours at 56 euro 60 cent and it will be 700 megawatt hours at 30 euro and 20 cent per megawatt hour per megawatt hour and then as you move to the next tier tier three between 1000 megawatt hours and 2400 megawatt hours that's five euro per megawatt hour so there's no encouragement to waste fuel at that because you know pellets will probably be costing you or certainly wood chip will be costing you over five cent Per kilowatt hours, there's no point in wasting it if you're only getting um, 0.5 of a cent per kilowatt hour. Just to give an example here of how that would work. So if you take a mushroom unit, and if we assume the cost of a 400 kilowatt boiler going into that mushroom unit will be 160,000 euro. And if we assume that it's running for 900,000 kilowatt hours per year or 900 megawatt hours per year. So if you look at 900 megawatt hours, that's tier one and tier two uh, we're, we're looking at there. So it's the oil that's been displaced is 88,500 litres in this particular situation. So the oil cost, if we assume a cost of the oil of 90 cent per litre, that will be um, um, an annual cost of almost 80,000 euro per year, 79,650. Now, some of you are probably looking at this and saying, I can't buy oil at 90 cent per litre. And that's probably is the case. So the higher your price per oil, the quicker your payback is going to be, but I'm just going to assume this figure for, for the purposes of this ex exercise. Um, so your, sa your savings per year of using, uh, you know, you need wood chip. If you assume the wood chip would be coming in at five cent per kilowatt hour delivered in at that price, your wood chip is costing you 45,000 euro as opposed to the oil, which is costing you at 90 centiliters, uh, almost 80,000. So the savings there per annum is 34,650. So without any SSRH, without any support scheme for renewable heat, you are still getting a payback within 4.6 years. Um, you are also getting a tax relief in the form of that it's it, it's accelerated capital allowances, which is available on this uh, for the purchase of this uh, efficient technology. Um, the SSRH does add the extra income because now we're getting tier one at 300 megawatt hours. We've been paid 56 euro 60 cent. That's coming at 16,980. Plus we're getting 600 megawatt hours in tier two. We could get up to 700 if we, if we, if we had enough, but we're only using 600 of that tier two. And that at 30 euro and 20 cent per megawatt hour, that's 18,120. Add the two of those together, those SSRH payments for tier one and tier two. Uh, we get that for 15 years, by the way. So that's 35,100 euro that's payable, that's paid there. We add that to our annual savings of the difference between the wood chip saving and the oil saving. And that's a total saving of uh, 52,080 euro or a payback of 3.1 years. And you do continue to get that SSRH payment for the full 15 years. Um, some people ask the question about the emission factor because you know it's within a business there are savings that can be made in terms of um, uh, you know that, that if you're tendering for a particular contract that you can say that your carbon you've reduced your carbon footprint and how what, what impact does it have on the carbon footprint so if you look here in the case of kerosene oil if you assume it is 10.5 kilowatt hours of energy per liter and a thousand if you use a thousand liters in your own home domestic tank that's 10,500 kilowatt hours uh, of energy. And you multiply that by the emission factor here of 0.257. That's almost 2.7 tons of CO2 that's saved by using biomass as opposed to using the kerosene. So that's the emission factor associated with your 1,000 litres of burning kerosene is 2.7 tons of CO2. 
So in this, uh, using that in this example here, we've uh, we've produced 900,000 kilowatt hours thermal. So our average emissions from our Irish fossil fuel boilers have been estimated at 0.257 uh, kilograms per kilowatt hour. That's based on kerosene. Uh, and uh, the, so the CO2 reduction for this particular example is 231 ton of CO2 per year. You don't get paid for it at the moment. But who knows what way that's going to go with carbon farming and the opportunities to get paid for carbon being offset. So that is, uh, but at, that is the actual saving that has been generated by the deployment of that biomass boiler. That could be helpful for winning a contract or a tender. It, it may be put you at an advantage. There are agriculture opportunities for agricultural supply chains around the supply of biomass uh, to sell renewable heat. We probably will see more structures like biomass trade centers, and these are the link between the growers and the consumers of the biomass. And um, there are good examples of biomass trade centers there at the moment of people who are involved in this industry. But I think as we see more and more of these boilers being deployed, we will see more opportunities for more localized structures to be developed. And the main feedstocks coming from an agricultural base would include pulp wood from forestry. We don't want to be uh, bur uh, burning the round wood or the, the top, the saw log or, or that type of timber. It's the pulp wood, which is a lower value from forestry. And of course, um, straw, purpose grown energy crops. Uh, you'll see opportunities for grass silage, for biogas and aerobic digestion plants coming in the future as well. The main supply chain considerations are um, the fuel properties of the supplied material. So we will see biomass supply chains and it'll be important that you're able to converse with these supply chains about you know the what your boiler can tolerate in terms of you know chlorine levels or uh, how much ash will be produced the frequency of the emptying of the ash box all that kind of stuff the storage and its effect on fuel quality the boiler type uh, destination what some boilers are more robust than others some can take fuels that maybe 35 40 percent moisture but the more robust ones some the warranty might only be for maybe 20% moisture content in the fuel that's going in. So these are kind of things that you would need to be aware of. You have to understand the difference between energy tons and metric tons. So, um, you know, a, a ton of wood chip at 50% moisture, moisture content will have a very different energy content than that of a, a, a ton at maybe 20% moisture content. So fun, then the, the funding mechanisms, there will be fun, different funding mechanisms from the likes of maybe leader, maybe um, the, the likes of this SSRH, um, and of course the uh, the capital investment scheme for horticulture as well. So the SSRH is going to make a big difference. And of course, there are boilers where you can burn whole bales. So this is a picture I took in Denmark that's going into a poultry unit and uh, they're using whole bales of uh, miscanthus in this particular situation and burning them to generate heat. Uh, for the poultry unit. So you, it's in this particular example, you don't need to uh, put it into pellets or you don't need to put it into a chip. You can just uh, feed it in in whole bale form and the, there's a, a macerator ahead of the boiler uh, combustion zone that, that shreds it up. Um, it's important with biomass is to get the sizing right of the, the biomass store. Oil is about 11 times more energy dense than wood chip uh, and switching to biomass fuel does require considerable storage and a more regular fuel deliveries. This may be an issue as well for some of you that have biosecurity on farms where you're worried about maybe tires coming in on, on, on site on a regular basis. So it's important maybe to consult with your wood fuel supplier to understand the delivery volumes and the schedules. Yeah, a store for more than one week of fuel may be required maybe over the likes of a Christmas break to make sure that you have enough fuel to keep you going. Uh, the size of the fuel store should be 125% of the load size because inevitably you will have a certain amount left over from the previous delivery and to allow for a full delivery truck to come in. Uh, ensure the room for delivery vehicles and method of offloading. So this is something that people make that mistake. that There isn't enough room for a truck to turn when it comes in uh, and just to allow for that. So it is possible to calculate based on whether it's a, an 18 kilowatt or an 80 kilowatt boiler our 350 kilowatt boiler, about determining you know the the floor area required for the storage, the the potential the uh, the fuel input as well, and how much storage that you'd have, for example, for uh, you know an 80 kilowatt boiler, um, with the floor area of 1150 square meters, uh, based on you know 25 kilograms of fuel being used per hour, 
how many hours or days storage that you'd have on, you know, whether it's you're going from one cubic meter of storage up to 48 cubic meters of storage. So that just gives you an idea. You do need to work these things out in advance. In terms of sizing the boiler, these boilers, uh, is, um, you know, they, they work best when they're not, uh, when, when they run at full tilt, essentially. This stopping and starting of biomass boilers is not ideal. So you're, you're trying to keep them running at full throttle all the time um, to, to get the highest efficiency out of them. So you're looking at the heat load profile. In this example, you can see there it's running, there is, is starting at six o'clock, just after six o'clock in the morning and running till six o'clock in the evening. Wouldn't be ideal, but you're trying, that's the heat profile of this particular building. Uh, so that's for, that's when you're looking at your own heat load profile to determine, um, you know, do you need to need it to be running all the time or is it only for set hours? Ideally, we should have a profile of the heat load that's required by the site. This usually requires heat metering equipment, whether it's permanent or temporary. And this will give you a picture uh, of the, the load profile of the business. So biomass boiler is sized generally 50 to 80 percent of the maximum and the energy store can supply the remainder. So you can see in this situation here, you have a, um, you know, it's coming on at six o'clock in the morning. It's turned off again, just after six o'clock in the evening. So this area, this early area, you're working off the, the buffer storage from the accumulator tank. Um, and, and then your, 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 uh, your, 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 your 800 kilowatts is driving heat to your thermal store at this time of the day, as well as providing the heat uh, for, for your for your for your requirement as well, but it's it's also providing uh, storage, uh, your your storage heat as well, which will be required again the following day. So thermal storage is critical to biomass boiler operations. Between five and sixty liters per kilowatt thermal is the general rule of thumb, depending on the boiler type. The thermal store or the buffer tank helps to even out the demand on the boiler, but maintain the heat supply uh, throughout the short term peaks of heating requirements may have to be supplied by fossil fuels, for example, poultry houses with chicks. That's very often they have a, a, a you know, this heat requirements and uh, that might peak at certain times. You wouldn't be able to peak with your biomass boiler. So you may have oil as a backup uh, to, to reach those peak requirements. Um, oversizing of biomass boilers is to be avoided to minimize capital expenditure, especially when compared to similar sized fossil systems. Um, and many people have, you can oversize a, um, an oil boiler, you can oversize a gas boiler, but oversizing a biomass boiler doesn't make a lot of sense. It's like hitting a big tractor to do the work that a small tractor will do. It's going to be less efficient and you'd be using a lot more fuel to generate the same outcome. Um, per kilowatt, a biomass boiler can be up to 10 times the cost of a fossil fuel boiler. So this is uh, goes back to my example earlier on. You know, it's really you're trying to get the the the, the repayment on your capex expenditure of moving from fossil fuel boiler to a biomass boiler, and between the fuel saving and the SSRH, that's that's what's bridging that gap. Use a smaller a smaller boiler with respect to peak loads, and use it to charge a thermal store. The boiler will run continuously, and the thermal store will meet the peak loads. Um, a 10,000 liter thermal store or a buffer tank or accumulator tank that can supply 170 kilowatts for one hour or 340 kilowatts for 30 minutes at a change in temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. So after this period of time, the thermal store will need to be recharged with the heat from the boiler itself. Um, other things to consider, not only the peak heat load in kilowatts, but also the total heat energy consumed in kilowatt hours on the farm in a year and the total hours where there is a heat demand in the year. So this is really looking at when is the boiler going to be on? Will it be potentially turned off at certain times of the year? Uh, will it be required in the summer months, for example? And you see this example in schools, for example, which they're turned off in the summertime of the year, for example, it's not as efficient. The more hours that is in use, the quicker the payback that you're going to get from the overall investment. Biomass boiler should be sized for the base load, not the peak load. Um, leaving the fossil system in place to provide the peak load is an option. So many people put in what's a T pipe uh, and they don't replace the whole system completely that they allow the, the gas or the oil to maybe to, as a backup. The support that's there for this is the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine Cap Capital Investment Grant support, which gives 40% support towards uh, the likes of these biomass boilers. 
50 percent support is available for um, people under the age of 35 and who are qualified under the age of 35 and there's a possibility of getting PO support of up to 50 percent there are conditions around producer organizations as well so the, the, these offers are generally made through the investment grant support it, from March uh, and payment is made after inspection so there may be a bridging requirement there where you have to get a loan to cover the um, the grant aspect of it and then that you can pay that back fairly fast after the grant is approved. The energy generator can only be used in the business, so you're not allowed to use your own house in, in, that, in those calculations. Um, horticulture for greenhouse heating, that requires low level heating to prevent frost damage. It's very cost competitive compared to fossil fuels. And uh, nowadays there's more pressure on producers to be more sustainable. For example, the likes of, um, you know, to win contracts with supermarkets, etc. The SCAI support scheme for renewable heat has driven biomass interest, especially in the in the mushroom industry. Uh, the the SSRH is available, but be aware of building regulations and requirements for building energy performance. So there's an assumed energy requirement of mushroom units, of everything from poultry units, everything that's covered under the SSRH. They just won't assume that you're um, that you know that that uh, every mushroom unit or every building that you're saying is going to be used will have the energy uh, a particular energy requirement. It, it's there's a deemed requirement, and you should be below that. Um, and also that you should have been using fossil fuels in the past. So if you're coming from a situation where you've already moved to biomass, that's a bit of an issue because um, you will not get paid for uh, putting in the new biomass boiler. It has to be changing from a fossil fuel to the biomass. And you should seek technical guidance for the specific heat demand requirements um, of, of, of your business. So just to finish up there, Donald, um, there's opportunities for the development on horticultural units, great opportunities. There's ne it's necessary to plan the storage requirements and size the boiler adequately, don't oversize it. Uh, biomass can meet on-site heating and process energy needs. Oil and gas prices have continuously fluctuated in recent months and an increase in prices is coming uh, is likely in the coming years. And that's mainly due to carbon taxes. We will see even without any war in Ukraine, we would see carbon taxes be, uh, you know, coming on top of uh, the price of fossil fuels, making them um, uh, more expensive. Ireland will see an increased shift towards farm use of renewable energy. And uh, biomass does reduce greenhouse gases within the production system. So it, if we can start monetizing that and getting paid for those greenhouse gas uh, reductions, that would be another benefit as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Barry. Thanks very much, Barry. That's great. A couple of questions coming in there on the, the Q&A as well. So um, we'll come back to them later, Barry, if that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much. And if anybody else wants to add in questions there, you can drop them into the, the Q&A box uh, down on the, the bottom of your screen. So we're going to move on next to Peter McMahon. So Peter, you can you can turn on your, your screen there as well, if you like, and your speaker or microphone. Um, Peter McMahon uh, co-founded Kilmoon Cross Nurseries with his wife, Nolene, over 25 years ago. Peter is now a non-executive director of the nursery, and it's now managed by the next generation of the family, um, Andrea and PJ. So prior to working in horticulture, Peter also held many different senior positions in corporate tech, healthcare, and agribusiness. So Peter's got a very good, uh, I suppose, rounded business view and uh, very good technical um, experience with biomass and heating. So Peter, I'm going to hand over to you. I can hear. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you there. I can't see you. I'm, but I'm, I can... I'm not able to start the, uh, the video, but yeah. There, there you go. We have you now. That's yeah. great. <laughs> Very I'm good. going to share your presentation as well, Peter, and then you can just tell me to, to move on as you want, okay? All right. So, First of all, thank you all for affording me the opportunity to share our uh, experience with biomass. Just a little bit about us. Um, we started in 1992. Uh, we have three and a half acres under glass, and we grow for basically the retail trade and indeed the multiples. Um, we employ 14 people, and it's now a second generation business. My uh, two adult children now are running the business. So that gives you an overview of there we are. And uh, the next slide, please, Donald. Uh, that's our Christmas crop, which at the moment we're in the middle of. Uh, we <laughs> Tough time of the year, but that's my daughter, Andrew, who's the general manager. Uh, we distribute the poncettas uh, throughout the 32 counties. Um, next slide, Donald, please. 
So um, to start with really, you know, the agenda really was the evaluation and then, you know, our primary goals, costs of energy, our pitfalls, I think, and mistakes, which is probably the best part of the presentation and the outcomes in the summary. So to start with the evaluation, if you go on to the next slide, Donald, um, we engaged uh, Intertrade Ireland. They have a program called Fusion, or they did five or six years ago. And um, we uh, hired a graduate um, who was on the Fusion program and we got a 50% grant. And the graduate studied uh, geothermal, um, solar, wind, and indeed biomass, and to decide which was the best one for us. Um, the graduate was, uh, was mentored by a professor, uh, an expert in energy at Queen's University. His name was Professor Johannes. Um, next slide, Donald, please. So at the end of the evaluation, anyway, our, our key primary goals were to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel, uh, to be green as we're growers and to try and move in that direction, but namely also uh, to reduce our heavy dependence on medium light oil and use a more cost efficient, clean form of energy. And biomass was the outcome that suited our needs best. Next uh, slide, please. Um, I suppose the sad thing about it was uh, that was disappointing was we, we, we made a mistake in, in the appointment of our service provider. I mean, we just didn't do enough work. Um, we were lucky that we had specced a Linka burner and indeed a Dan Stoker boiler because they are the world lead market leaders in, in what they do. Um, and it's very important that you select the correct burner and, and boiler when you're doing it. Um, and you know, therefore you can burn, you know, really, really higher calorific uh, types of, 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 of material. Um, which can, you know, if you don't, uh, in some of the burners that have been on sale, you know, the actual, you know, the calorific value when it's really high when it's burning has actually, you know, challenged the integrity of the metal. Uh, with serious installation problems uh, with, with the service provider, I mean, from drawings and services not being on, uh, specking the incorrect cable, you know, the backup water tanks for our needs were just inadequate and they weren't properly insulated. In fact, the tanks were actually sitting on concrete outdoors with a thin insulation around them, which was, was absolutely of no use. And the burner should have been probably 1.2 megawatt. And the reason that was because when it gets cold at minus two, we used to have colder winters, but now it's not so bad. Um, I think we, we are, um, we're, we're, we're sort of, it seems that the weather seems to be better now, um, but we had to make major changes and, 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 and very summarily, we, we, we looked at about 10 different types of fuels from coconut to, you know, to husks, to viscances, to, you know, uh, willow, but we ended up with pellets. We found it was the cleanest, best uh, one for us. We erected two 20 ton silos uh, that were installed by PE. And uh, we obviously uh, parted with the installer, even though they got fully paid, but life is what it is. And uh, we appointed Clear Power as service provider for the maintenance of the contract. The next slide, please, Donald. So the outcomes really were that the biomass does work. It works very well. Um, it supports three and a half acres of glass at the, the temperatures that we require in the winter. However, if it's very cold, and what I mean by very cold, I mean below zero, we would have to engage one of our three megawatt oil burners, which we've kept. Uh, we didn't uh, remove them because first of all, it would have been very costly. But secondly, we use them also to, to, uh, to retain some water, which goes, circulates around the houses. And that keeps the boilers in good shape. Uh, we've made significant savings, uh, and I think uh, that's already been referred to uh, earlier. There is significant savings that have been made, and we've made them, and we were very happy uh, with it. Um, and I think, again, you know, servicing these burners is very important. So, you know, Clear Power have been absolutely fantastic. Uh, I would recommend them to anybody. Um, the three one megawatt burners are not in use, as I said, and they're kept alive. Uh, but we'll also use the hot water storage. Our next steps are going to be to explore newer technologies. Um, I think we probably look at geothermal, or not geothermal, but we look at uh, probably uh, solar. Uh, we're interested in having a look at and to further reduce our uh, carbon footprint. Next slide, please, Donald. Uh, here's a photograph <clears throat> of uh, or a drone shot of uh, the glass houses, but also the, the two silos there, they're the two 20 ton silos. So they're very neat and tidy. Here's the 80,000 liter uh, water tank, which is storage for storage. And this is the burner is in here. Originally, the shed and uh, the, the filler that was out here is all gone. We used to be filling that uh, shed full of uh, Liscances and, uh, um, and um, Willow. Next slide, please, Donald. This is the back view of the burner. Um, this is the, the, this, the area here. Here's the ash can, which was left off the drawing. Um, next slide, please. And this is the uh, view from the front. There's the link burner there. It's actually fired by an, uh, a regular home uh, diesel uh, oil fire, a little lighter. 
Um, it uses about maybe five gallons a year. So you're not using a lot of diesel. Uh, next slide, please. And that's her at full tilt when we're, we're burning. Uh, and next slide again, Donna, please. But this is the panel that's, uh, that's wired, the wiring for it. Uh, we've two variable controllers. This is for a, a pump that's pumping to, from the burner to the 80,000 litre tank. And this is a variable speed controller for the secondary fans on the burner itself. Next slide, please. Um, this, is, this is one of probably the best things that Link can provide. It's an app that can go on your phone, on your laptop, anywhere. You can interrogate faults. You can actually make changes to parameters if you want. Um, you can make manual changes. You can look at all the trends. You can look at your heating. As you can see here, the combustion was low at that point. There was a lot of fuel in it, obviously. If it's at 8%, it's, it's really nice to burn it around between 9 and 10%. It's perfect for uh, full efficiency. But you can see there, she's getting up to temperature as well. She's at 87. She'd shut off at 90. Next slide, please, Donna. So in summary, I would have to be saying I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a propounder for biomass. It's certainly far cleaner than oil. It's less expensive, much easier to run. And we have certainly reduced our carbon footprint with it. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so, Peter, what we'll, what we'll do is we'll, we'll leave the questions till the end. Uh, so thanks for your excellent yeah. presentation. It's good to get an insight like that from a grower. Uh, who's been through the process uh, and has has seen some challenges through throughout uh, but look we'll we'll get to some questions there at the end so uh, next i would like to hand over to jer cross uh, who's the director of woodco uh, woodco is an irish manufacturer of biomass boilers uh, up to 500 kilowatt so uh, they provide multi-fuel both chip and pellet uh, biomass boilers so woodco also exports to the uk U United States, uh, Canada, and EU countries such as Holland and Portugal. Jer has supplied over 5,000 boilers during his career. So uh, he's but this way, he's got a lot of uh, insight to what can what can go wrong with boilers. Uh, so look, we'll we'll have a bit of a, a discussion, Jer. Uh, if you if you don't mind, if you wouldn't mind, turn on your 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 camera and coming off mute, please. Yeah. Grand. So uh, Jer, first of all. Uh, uh, also, just to inform everybody that Jer is also involved in solar PV since 2018, so a lot of your business would be involved in solar at the moment. Uh, so just in relation to biomass, uh, so Jer, can you give me some examples of, of uh, producers who have switched from fo fossil fuel heat source uh, to, to biomass and uh, potential savings that the growers have made uh, with the SSRH scheme? and the potential fuel savings, if there are any, given the inflated cost of biomass pellets at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have about, we have eight, eight horticultural growers now um, um, installed boilers at their sites over the last uh, three years or so, and we've three more to do next year. So, so and um, all of them would have availed of the SSRH scheme. So the, the SSRH, and I know many horticultural growers, to be fair, were early adopters for biomass and so many were on were on biomass beforehand and uh, couldn't avail of the scheme so was, uh, so the eight that we did um all were, were exclusively on fossil fuels and then moved over to biomass mm -hmm. in the main um it's been actually actually there's nine actually now that i think of it uh, in the main most of them were on wood pellet and um and getting significant savings um there was a time 12 months ago wood pellets was around 250 euro a ton and the fuel would have been costing maybe five to five and a half cents a kilowatt hour. And they were getting the SSRH subsidy, which was getting them, giving them back probably 3.8 to 4.3 cents a kilowatt hour. So their heating was costing about 1.2 or 1.3 cents a kilowatt hour. So on, on like Barry's example there, with a 900,000 kilowatt hours, their heating might only have been costing nine grand a year. So the, so the savings 12 months ago on pellet would have been about 75 to 85% savings by switching from oil. And uh, if they were switching from wood to uh, from oil to wood chip, they'd have been saving almost ninety percent. So significant savings for the for the growers. Um, there's been a little bit of a um, um, a disconnect now. The price of pellets has increased. Uh, in fact, it has doubled, uh, and the price of wood chip has remained remarkably stable. And just a, a little commentary on the, price, the reason wood pellets have got so expensive is. Um, I suppose Europe, given the whole Ukrainian crisis, um, are now hoovering up lots of pellets wherever they can get them from Canada or, or all all the usual markets, um, trying to get 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 off gas. 
but whereas wood chip is uh, so wood wood pellets are a global commodity shipped around the world, whereas wood chip is is um generally sourced locally. So you generally purchase wood chip within an hour or two of, of your of your farm, and um it, the costs are, have remained remarkably stable. So wood chip is now in terms of a cent per kilowatt hour is around four and a half cents a kilowatt hour, whereas wood pellets has now gone to about nine, ten, eleven cents a kilowatt hour. So. That's a little unfortunate because I'm a big fan of wood pellets, but it's um it's a nice clean, like Peter said, uh, nice clean, highly ener high energy fuel. But wood chip, um, is is equally as good. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about it is the boilers we supply are all multi fuel, so they can operate on wood chip or wood pellet. Um, but the only thing is the fuel distribution or the fuel supply from the store, uh, to the boiler is what's different. So I said, yeah. So no, so I was just going to uh, lead on to that. So it's like some of the growers that you would have supplied uh, biomass boilers to over the last few years, uh, and you said most of them have gone uh, to a, a pellet boiler. Mm -hmm. Are some of them growers coming back to you now and saying that we're we want to switch over to chip? Or yeah, absolutely. How, 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 how easy is it? Is that done in your it, case? It, it, yeah, yeah. No, so, uh, so two two to answer two points to your question yes there are there's certainly some growers you, they're using lots of energy are are noticing um the price of pellets is impacting them so there's making the switch to wood chip basically wood chip is half the price of pellets um so um but uh, there's a bit of capex involved and um, they would probably have purchased initially a, a, a vertical silo with a with a, a chore time flexi auger for maybe seven or eight thousand euro for a pellet uh they can now probably sell that and if they convert to wood chip, they have two options. They can either build a shed, which might cost them 15, 20, 25K, and put a, a, a sweep arm auger into it. Uh, or if they don't have the space to build a shed, they can build a, a silo. The silo costs about maybe 17, 18,000. And then you have you have a kind of a, you, can, you have a, to come up with a mechanism of getting the chip from a walk-in floor truck into the silo, which could be about twelve to fifteen thousand of it. So all told, there's probably a forty k capex involved in, in in putting in a wood chips silo with all the conveying equipment, um, which can probably sell your pellet silo and auger for five or six k, I suppose. You know, so there is it. But but I think guys are taking uh, taking the view. Okay, there's a bit a bit more capex involved in the short term, but I think they could recover their their costs within a year or a year and a half. You know. Mm -hmm. Now, the only thing when you do switch over to a chip, there's likely going to be more maintenance required. Maybe possibly, is was there possibly more breakdowns? Um, because the fuel is maybe a bit more inconsistent. Yeah, although I have to say, because it's on the SRH scheme, um, it, it kind of a, it's kind of a watchdog on on fuel quality. So, th so the fuel that you're putting into your wood chip boiler has to be certified by the WFQA Wood Fuel Quality Assurance. And that's one of the things I've really noticed in the last two years. The quality of wood chip is exceptional now. I mean, it's um, the days of getting big lumps of chip in and coming literally coming straight from a forestry into your boiler. Those days are gone. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that um, you shouldn't have any great uh, uh, difficulties uh, with, with the wood chip that's on the market now. Granted, um, some practical things like there's probably three times more ash from wood chip than, than there is from wood pellets. So a little bit more maintenance in that regard. And um, and the motors and the augers are all big, uh, more mechanical pieces of kit. So that you know, if uh, there might be a little bit uh, more maintenance in them. But in the main, I have to say, um, wood chip at G thirty, which is say thirty mil in, the, in diameter, at twenty percent moisture, it's as it's it's uh, it's behaves very similar to pellet. You know. Okay. And how often do you, do you recommend that you service the boiler yourself? Do you have a specific recommendation, or do you have yeah. service contracts which which yes. from your suppliers? Yeah. yeah, on on the on the SSR hate scheme, it, it's incumbent. It's part of the rules of the scheme that you must have a maintenance contract and service your boiler. So so we do a maintenance contract with most uh, horticulture growers for to service the boiler twice a year, and we also have remote monitoring where we can remote the boiler um, remotely if there is any issues. But listen, depending if there's if there's more hours used, if the boiler's running for four or five or six thousand hours a year, it's probably a third service, you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's grand. No, thanks a million, Jeff, for just giving us that yeah. uh, answering a couple of those questions. I, I think there are questions at the top of everyone's head yes. uh, when when considering uh, biomass. So, uh, Donald, I'll hand it over to yourself if you want to uh, go through some of the questions there for with Barry and Peter and Jer. That's great, Donald. Thanks very much. Yeah, um, Peter, I'll let you. Uh, 
join there with your mic and camera as well. So um, yeah, a couple of questions coming in there. So um, I'll start off with the, the first one. Um, in the past, cereal grains and in particular oats were investigated as a potential fuel for biomass burners. Are they now being reconsidered for this purpose or does the current high grain prices rule out it on economic terms? The advantage would be more reliable moisture content and a cleaner material to handle in comparison to wood and biomass. So I might I put that to Barry first, if that's yeah, there okay. Was a, there, was a, there was a great emphasis there on grain burning there a number of years ago. We did research in it at Chagas and Oak Park, and you know there was the high potassium content of grain that leads to a very low ash softening temperature. So at a very low temperature, it starts to um, turn to an ash. So it is a low, what we call it, low ash melting point. So the grain, my grain are, ash it softens at maybe 700 degrees celsius for wheat maybe oats was i think it was around a thousand degrees celsius you know compared to wood chip which would be around 1300 degrees celsius so as a fuel yes there are boilers that are suited for burning grain but not all boilers are suited for it um, now you will get some multi-purpose boilers where you might have to cha start changing grates but um, uh, there was a number of um, tillage farmers in the area around the Thai they invested in particular biomass boilers that could burn uh, black oats, which wasn't deemed to be something that would be suitable for the food chain. So this issue does come up in relation to oats. That is something that can be eaten. And it's, it's a, that the food versus fuel debate generally tends to emerge in that situation. But, you know, yeah, you're right. When the price of grain is at a certain price, it makes it, um, you know, it's, it's not feasible to burn the grain. But that's not to say like three tonne of oats is the same as about a thousand litres of home heat and oil. So it, it's down to what, what, what makes more sense at a given time. And on a farm, if you're using that grain to dry down grain, uh, it, it, you know, that could be the, the use of it. Then uh, if you're only using it temporarily, it might be a good use of your product. But the fact that you can use the byproduct, which is straw, there are boilers now where you can run the straw on, on it and very, very effectively, um, you know, that, you know, there's, there's a, rather than use the food component, you're using the byproduct, if that makes sense. Um, you know, so okay. there can be issues with carbon monoxide emissions as well when you're, when you're using grain also. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much, Barry. Jared, do you want to come in there or what your experience of using different materials or different fuel types? Yeah, well, well, I suppose we're we're exclusively on woody biomass, and uh, just just uh, I, I suppose one, one would want to be careful. Um, um, boilers are generally when they're being tested and certified for sale on the market, um, they're tested with a specific fuel. So ours are tested with wood pellets and wood chips, but so um, it probably wouldn't be um correct to use um and a, a fuel outside of those, you know. But there are other fuels that the boilers are completely multi fuel. And have been tested with straw and with oats and all that. So that's just one thing to be careful about. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. I know, and having chatted with Peter previously, I think you were using um quite a range of different materials, uh, some flower some shells dogs, at some yeah, point. Yeah. yeah. We just found <coughs> there was a clinker that came in the ash as a result of the uh, sunflower. I mean, fabulous fuel to burn, but just too dirty for us. Sure. Uh, disposal of the husks when, you know, the ash and it really clumped. And sometimes, you know, it was just, just, we burned about, I'd say about maybe 50 ton and, you know, the, the, the amount of stuff we had to disposal, we had to get it mo removed off site, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't a runner. Uh, we burned coconut as well, it was another thing we burned, but uh, we burned a lot of different stuff. Uh, again, the food one was a big one. We were looking at horses, nuts and things like that, and they were quite cheap where we could get to be the source that we could get them cheap. And uh, we thought it might be a good idea, but then again, this food issue about, you know, do you... Do you actually use food with so many hungry people around the world as well? Do you know what I mean? Use it as a fuel. It's not, it's not very politically correct, is it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, but, I'll, you know, I'll, but, but you know, Don, that the, the basic fuel properties of cereal grains it does make them contenders as biomass yeah. fuels. Yeah, yeah. yeah you yeah. know, especially this, Yeah, especially at the smaller boiler range of maybe ten to twenty-five kilowatts, maybe for heating single homes, um, that that type of range. But it's, it's not. It's not a it's not something that you could rule out either. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to try and drive on and we'll try and get as many of these answered before five as I can. Um, given the varying water content and sources, is wood chip as efficient in terms of running costs? So labor getting it working right and does it provide the, the same, I suppose the, the same energy output? Um, well, Barry, 
Yeah, well, I mean, if you, if you again, it's down to the boiler. If you put, uh, if the warranty on the boiler is for twenty percent moisture content, and if you put material into that boiler and it's say, 30 40 percent moisture content, you are, are breaching the warranty on the boiler for a start. But you can't expect ignition uh, on that boiler to be the same as it would be if you had the twenty percent moisture material going into it. Uh, so you have to be very, very boiler specific. Um, you can buy a more robust boiler because the issues that you're going to have by burning wetter material is potentially carbon monoxide, for example. So you do need to have controls and your boiler settings to make sure that that w won't be an issue. And I'm sure Jared can come in on this as well to talk about, you know, how they, uh, what kind of controls they have on the, on the Lambda control systems to make sure that there won't be issues with CO or NOx emissions, et cetera. Yeah. And what we're finding is most of the wood chip on the market, like pellet, is is, is made to a standard. It's between six and eight percent moisture content, so there's no issue there. Um, wood chip, we are finding because of that WFQA standard, uh, 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 wood fuel quality assurance standard, and any wood that's air dried for six or seven months uh, and then chipped, it's generally around twenty to twenty-two or three percent moisture content, which is excellent, excellent wood chip fuel as far as we'd be concerned, you know. And um, so. Um, yeah, and, and that gives good calorific value of about three and a half thousand uh, kilowatts per ton. And that's where, that's where you want to be. And Jor, maybe you might comment as well on the, I suppose, the tolerance levels of, uh, you know, of, of moisture in, in the boilers and how they differ. Uh, you know, is it duplex steel that's required in the boiler to determine, you know, to prevent corrosion? Is there, and what controls the carbon monoxide a challenge that that might be with certain fuels as well at high moisture. Yeah. Well, again, um, it, most most people um, want to buy uh, procure um, dry wood chip and and then it's a, it's a normal steel combustion chamber, a little bit of ceramic brick in the burner pot. But if you're sure you're going to be using fifty percent moisture wood all the time, you should get, you should purchase your boiler with a, a ceramic lining. And, and also, in some cases, they have a thing called an economizer, which is able to capture some of the latent heat that's in the in the uh, condensate that comes off the wood fuel and to make it more efficient. Generally, that's on bigger boilers, boilers over 500 kilowatt. Um, so it is, I think you've alluded to it, Barry, in your presentation, it is, it is um, important to have a fair handle on what your likely fuel source is going to be and be consistent at that, at that you know. Um, uh, if you buy a boiler, uh, a smaller boiler, that's, it's designed to handle moisture content under 35% moisture and you come along and burn 50, 50 to 55% uh, moisture content, you're going to have problems, you know. So it's important to align your fuel supply with the type of, with the, with the model of boiler you have. And sorry, yeah, and, and nearly all modern boilers now have things like lambda sensors and vacuum regulators to measure the amount of oxygen in the combustion and make, make sure, give it a clean, consistent burning. So that's um, that's nearly standard now on boilers, I have to say. So I Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Chair, I'm going to follow on, but um, it's something that you might have experience on, but you're you're not representing SEAI, but do SEAI have... I have a target time frame for inspection of new boilers as the producer only gets paid after the inspection by SEAI. So maybe just some of your experience rather um, yeah. than what their policy is. Yeah, and that's some of the, the, the scheme is starting to move pretty well, I have to say, um, now at the front end. But I would agree, that's probably a loaded question from somebody there. So once you install your boiler, it can take I would say nearly five months before SEI will come out and inspect the boiler. And then it's only then you're getting, you get paid on the SSRH. And the reason for the delay, this is the, uh, basically they do a desktop evaluation first. And so we have to, so once the boiler's installed, we have to submit everything like fuel bills, commissioning cert, pictures of the job, recce cert, fair, a fair old file has to go into them. And I guess they, they take their time looking at that. And, and then when they're sure everything's in order, they'll come out and physically inspect it to make sure, check the heat meters. And it's only from that point, then you start getting paid. But then once you're on the payment cycle and all that heavy lifting is done, you run it for the 15 years and it does go pretty smoothly after that, you know. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. Um, another kind of follow on question from the SSRH is, uh, can you still avail of the SSRH scheme if you've no existing heat heating fuel system, i.e. if you're starting from scratch? Yes, I think you can. You can. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, what would be involved in growers 
growing their own biomass, for example, willow and shipping it themselves, is it likely to be inefficient in terms of cost um, and risks in terms of quality? And I, I know there, there would have been lots of support around the mid 2000s um, to develop that sector, but uh, I think there was a lot of interest pulled back from us then, probably seven or eight years later. Yeah, I suppose you had a lot of farmers that grew energy crops maybe back in 2006, 2007 and eight. They got grants from the Department of Agriculture at that time to put the crops into the ground. But uh, I suppose it was no, I suppose around 2009, 2010, the country went into recession and a lot of the money went into bailing out banks rather than developing supply chains around biomass. So we had a supply chain, but we didn't have a demand led policy. And eventually we did get the demand led policy in the form of an SSRH in 2019, which the scheme had stopped at that stage in terms of supplying grant aid for farmers to put the crop in the ground. So we don't have grant aid for willow growers or Miscanthus growers now at this stage. So you really need, we really needed a policy that had it all joined up the supply chain and the demand led. But to answer the question, yes, that is possible. And we see examples of it, you know, Gertrude College in, in Tipperary, they had an annual oil bill of 100,000 euro per year. They put in biomass boilers there and now they reduced their, uh, their, 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 their fuel has cost them 10,000 euro a year. That's in, even at today's current high oil prices. So they, are, they really slashed their bill by putting in willow uh, to replace their oil. And of course they use that for heat on the campus and for hot water for the students there as well. Um, and there's lots of examples in the UK and Sweden and other countries where willow is being used as an energy crop. Um, you know, and it's just a matter of putting the structures and the infrastructure in place to mobilize the biomass from the field, dry it down, supply it into the boiler at the quality and quantity that's going to be needed. Um, and, you know, it will, as Jar said, have to be WFQA approved. So if you are a supplier, even to yourself, you will have to have your own WFQA approval, which is wood fuel quality assurance. Barry, thanks thanks for that kind of detailed answer. And I know we, I kind of got the impression that somebody was interested in maybe getting into growing biomass or investigating it more. You've quite a lot of experience on that, so maybe somebody could follow up with you. Or you've, I'd say you've you've got a lot of resources already online for that. Yeah, if somebody wants to make contact with me about that, we can we can discuss that absolutely. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. There's a one final question there, and it's kind of two parts to it. Um, if a producer wishes to expand in the future, can they apply for the SSRH again? So is there a time limit on it, or can they be given an allowance when applying? <clears throat> and uh, to qualify for the <clears throat> SSRH, do you have to completely transfer your heat supply away from fossil fuels? Now, Jerry, Jerry's given a comment on that already, so yeah. I might, I'll hand over directly to you. Yeah, so you, 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 can, you can have a biomass boiler already. And once you can demonstrate that, for example, if the biomass boiler isn't man enough to heat your entire farm and you're using gas or oil to supplement it, you can apply uh, to get uh, to put in another biomass boiler. And that biomass boiler will qualify for the SSRH and, mm -hmm. and you'll be paid for the amount of oil displaced. And um, so is there a second element to that question then, Donald? Or uh, the timeline is the is there um, a yeah, is, when does the SSRH close? Yeah, the SSRH is open till twenty twenty seven, so we plenty of, plenty of time. But uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a three hundred million uh, euro budget allocated for the for the um, SSRH. So I mean, it's um, it's we're probably two and a, two and a, three years into it now. You, George, just in terms of the I suppose the businesses within the agri sector that are that are applying for it at the moment. Would it be, is it horticulture, pigs, poultry mainly? Yeah, yeah. It's all the energy intensive agribusinesses, exactly those three sectors. Yeah. Uh, pigs, poultry and and uh, horticulture. Yeah. And it's a, it's, a, it's a cracking scheme for them. Uh, and the one thing I should say, I, in, in, I'm saying this in the context of SRH, the horticulture has been probably the easiest one for SEI to approve because there's no EPA issues. Most of the sites are non-EPA. So and and Donald Donald Gernon has done a, a KPI, a benchmark KPI to help SEAI. So to be honest, with you, if you put in an application for SSRH now in the horticulture sector, I'd be fairly confident you'd get your approval within about eight weeks. Um, that you'll get your letter of offer from them. So it's uh, and um they are um turning those ones around pretty because they've so many of them done now, you know. That's great, Chair. Donald, I'm gonna pass back to you. Um Grand. Okay. Thank Look, you very much. Uh, and thank you, Donald. And thanks to Barry and uh, and Jer and Peter and Owen Sweetman, who also who's in the background, who's helped us uh, organize these webinars. 
Uh, so lads, look, I think there's some excellent information there uh, for the audience. Uh, and I'd also like to thank everyone, the audience who, who joined and participated, not on, only on this webinar, on, but also on the previous two webinars we had. So uh, like we said at the beginning of the, the session, the, these webinars are being recorded. So the, the today's webinar will be available on the Chagas website and the Chagas U, YouTube channel uh, over the next coming days. Uh, and the, the two previous webinars are, are already up there on the, the Chagas Horticulture Development YouTube channel. So we're planning to hold uh, some live workshop sessions in, in the in the new year uh, on energy technology. So we'll keep you posted with these events. Uh, so without further ado, I think we'll leave it there. And uh, I'd like everyone to have a nice evening and all the best. Thanks, all. Thanks very much, everyone. Safe home. Yeah.